Okay, it looks like we are live. All right, good evening, everybody. And it looks like we've already got one question. Now, the topic that I'm anticipating focusing on is Jefferson versus Hamilton, the Washington and Adams administration. But I'm going to go ahead and put a poll out there and see what uh, y'all are studying. Okay, so what are y'all studying? All right. So let's go ahead and we are going to start with Wesley's question, okay? Because let's go ahead and start with our warm up. For many of you who are still studying the Constitution, the articles in the Constitution. So let's go ahead and take those questions first and then we'll kind of move on from there. So, what are the reasons that, uh, what was or were the reasons that Amer the original government created failed? So, why were the articles not successful? All right. So, when it comes down to it, Wesley, the operative principle of government is force. If a government cannot force anybody to do something, then it's not a government. You can't make laws unless there's some means to back it up. And so what you had here was in the Articles of Confederation, you had this uh, central government that was in charge of the army and navy and like waging a war, which we were successful, uh, thank God. But of course, again, thank France uh, as much as anything. But this government could not collect taxes and that was a problem anytime you're you're in a situation where a government cannot collect taxes that means that this government is supposed to be uh you know waging war and all of that but it can't collect a tax unless the states decide that they want to pay a tax and so all this government could do was request money from the states and some states may pay and others may not and so the issue here is that first of all the government can't tax now second of all this government had absolutely no control over the economy all right so that is that is an issue as well that there's no control over the economy uh which means that and i'm not saying like a planned economy or something like that but you could have to where north carolina could put a tariff on tobacco from virginia could say that we're going to so so you didn't have the commerce clause there wasn't a guaranteed free flow of commerce across the united states so these states were in a military alliance but they didn't have any well and then also there wasn't really any kind of like currency that was worth anything and of course that's what alexander hamilton's trying to do in his report on the public credit and so those are the the biggest things there is that the government couldn't tax and then you uh you know you've got a situation where there's you know states can block commerce from other states which is inhibiting the economy and then finally uh you know if i'm thinking in terms of three reasons i'm thinking the third one is that the articles had to be it, it they had to it had to be unanimous in order to amend them so that's really one of the biggest flaws of the articles of confederation was that it was inflexible so when you saw a problem problem it was nearly impossible so if you've got 13 people and you want to decide what kind of pizza to order you're not going to be able to find something that all 13 people are going to want to eat and so you would be at the mercy of that one person and there's always that one person who will not go along with the rest of the group and so that was one of the things there that really the Articles of Confederation, they were a glorified military alliance. Uh, and this is basically a, a confederation of free, sovereign, and independent states. Now, the Constitution uh, you know, leaves some sovereignty with the states. But when you look at the Constitution, you wouldn't call this free, sovereign, and independent states, uh, maybe partially sovereign, but not free, sovereign, and independent. So just as far as this federal government that was set up, even though they did do the Northwest Ordinance, they won the war okay. Uh, you know, Shays' Rebellion is, of course, another thing. That's one of the biggest things to remember as a causal factor behind the Constitutional Convention was Shays' Rebellion and how that went on for months and Massachusetts couldn't do anything about it and the central government had no authority to you know no power or authority to go into massachusetts and set that right so those are some of the reasons why the articles of confederation failed thank you for your question wesley 
All right. And let's see what else is. Yes, we will go over the Washington administration. OK, so uh, how would the Constitution be different if Jefferson and Adams had attended the convention? I can't really tell you that. That's like one of those big what ifs, uh, because really, had Jefferson been there, would I just I, I don't it's hard to imagine Jefferson in a room like that amongst all of those people. Jefferson was so soft spoken that I just how much would he have really uh, impacted it? And I think that Jefferson, even though I wouldn't call him an anti-federalist, so to speak, uh, even though you could say maybe a moderate anti-federalist in the sense that he wanted a Bill of Rights, uh, Jefferson, I don't know how well he would have gotten on in that crowd that was there in Philadelphia. John Adams, not sure how, what we would have seen there, but I think that uh, that you know, two people being in the room there uh, wouldn't necessarily have made that big of a deal, even though they're, you know, they're, they're major, uh, major people over there. But interesting question, Paul. All right. And so then uh, how did, okay, so how did, let's see, let's take a look at Zach's question. How did the American Revolution influence the Constitution and Bill of Rights? And how did the newly formed country decide to put the rules in effect without the use of the military? All right, not sure I quite understand that second part of that question, but uh, the American Revolution, of course, influenced the Articles of Confederation a great deal because with the American Revolution, it's like we don't want this outside authority telling us what to do. And so the Articles of Confederation, the reason why this central government was so weak is that these people had just been tyrannized by George III and Parliament, and they didn't want to give up that control. Now, the Bill of Rights, what we want to remember there is that the Constitution, as it came out of Philadelphia, uh, the Constitution was not... Uh, the Constitution that came out of Philadelphia was it didn't include a Bill of Rights. And so really, I think the American Revolution, the, the spirit of the American Revolution was very much alive with these anti-federalists who demanded a Bill of Rights. And they said that we want a Bill of Rights uh, because this is something that our liberties are that important. The Federalists are like, no, no, you've got plenty. We've got plenty of checks and balances in the actual Constitution. You don't need a Bill of Rights, says Hamilton in Federalist 84. But now remember, especially those of y'all that are farther ahead, you know that Hamilton, what he wants is a strong central government, that Hamilton has really no interest in a situation where, uh, you know, you've got a limited government. OK, so as far as that goes, I'd, I'd say that the American Revolution was very, very influential on the Bill of Rights. Now, the Constitution, we want to remember the influence of the Enlightenment and especially a philosopher, a French philosopher, Montesquieu. All right. So Montesquieu, who wrote The Spirit of the Laws, writing about the legislative, executive and judicial branches. So I would say that you want to make sure that you've got the Enlightenment philosophy as an influence on the Constitution. All right, and let's see here. Okay, so we've got the political parties here. Zoe, you've got a really popular question here, okay? Um, and so as far as you're getting them all mixed up, okay. Now, what we need to remember about Federalist and Anti-Federalist, okay? The, the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist, I wouldn't call them political parties because they're really, hey there, Div, uh, they're the they're really one issue. OK, so this is kind of like if somebody's like pro-life or pro-choice or something like that, uh, that they're not necessarily uh you know, it's not a permanent thing. Like if you think about this with, uh, you know, this whole Kavanaugh thing that's in the news where there are a couple of Democrats who are thinking about voting for Kavanaugh. There are a couple of Republicans who are thinking about, you know, about three Republicans that are thinking about voting against Kavanaugh. And so when you have a single issue, sometimes you, you know, people will make alliances based on a certain thing, but political parties are really long term. So what we need to remember is that the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, they are just about ratification, that once the Constitution is ratified, then that's it. Now, of course, the Federalist Party takes kind of the name from the Federalists because Hamilton's leading it and that sort of thing. But remember that Madison 
who was a Federalist. He was for the ratification of the Constitution. And then he ends up going over to Jefferson uh, once the Constitution is ratified because he realizes that he and Hamilton, they were allied on this one thing. They didn't necessarily have the same idea of where they wanted the government to go once the Constitution is ratified. So, Zoe, what you want to remember is that once the Constitution is ratified, let's forget about Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Now, remember, that if someone was an anti-federalist, then they're probably, now Democratic Republicans and Jeffersonians were talking about the same thing. Those are two designations for the same thing. So Democratic Republicans, Jeffersonian Republicans, Jeffersonians, that's all the same. Okay, so remember that the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, once the Constitution is ratified, that's it. Now, once uh, the Constitution's ratified, like right at first, there weren't necessarily any political parties, but then it became apparent that Jefferson and Hamilton, uh, and of course, you know, Madison's got his views, and Madison, I think, is somewhere in the middle and kind of sees Jefferson, well, Jefferson was his close personal friend, and also, I think, kind of sees Jefferson as the lesser of the two evils. I think Madison's somewhere in the middle of the two of them, but what happens here is the first party system is set up and let me go ahead and pull that up and we'll we'll go ahead and go over really the issues here but don't connect this federalist party even though most of the people who supported the ratification of the constitution are going to be on that hamiltonian side and most of the people that did not favor the constitutional go over to jefferson even though jefferson now i've got one video about jefferson that's one of my favorites of course i love me some jefferson uh, but I think that uh, that Jefferson, it's a video I've got on my YouTube channel called Jefferson and the Constitution, Not Love at First Sight. And so with Je Jefferson, when he sees the Constitution, he's like, I like a lot of this stuff. But there are some of these that some of the things in here, like he, he thought that there needed to be term limits. OK, that was something that was a big thing for him to have term limits. And, you know, of course, today we've got term limits for the presidency, but not for you know other people in the government or whatever, uh, you know, Congress uh, per se. All right. So as far as that goes, let me go ahead and share my screen. OK, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with y'all. And so that we can go over the first two party system. All right. So let's go ahead and let's say, OK, we are sharing. All right. We're going to share that. And then I'm going to project my screen on there. All right. And let me make sure that I can still see everybody. All right, so we're going to talk about now the first two-party system, okay, Jefferson versus Hamilton. Now, the first two-party system gets started around 1791 going to about 1816. And so you've got the Federalist Party led by Alexander Hamilton, and of course, John Adams is also part of this Federalist Party as well. And then the Jeffersonian Republican Party, okay? Now, uh, the Jeffersonian Republican Party, note that that is the same as the Democratic Republican Party. It's just It just depends on what your preference is. I tend to go for uh, Jeffers Jeffersonian Republicans is how historians have typically referred to this party, whereas Democratic Republican is how political scientists have typically referred to this party. And both of these are, are set up like the, the reason for both of these. They're artificial because Jefferson called his party the Republican Party. But we have to differentiate it from the Republican Party that was founded in the 1850s, which is the Republican Party of today, which is the same organization, the party of Abraham Lincoln. And so we have to basically call this party something other than what Jefferson called it in order to avoid confusion. Hey there, Stratton. All right. So going on from there. Now, the first two-party system, of course, I've got this on a YouTube video as well, if you want to watch it again. Uh, I'm going to go into the leaders, their thoughts on federalism, their fears, their views of the Constitution, yada, yada, yada. So first of all, Hamilton and John Adams leading the Federalist Party, and then Jefferson and James Madison leading the Republicans. As far as 
federalism. Okay, so now remember, and this is the other thing, Zoe, this is the other tough part about this, is that when we think of federalism, we need to have that distinct from the Federalist Party, because federalism is the division of government power between two levels of government. So you've got the central government and the uh, and the state government. So how is it that they view federalism? Now, Hamilton and the Federalists favored a strong central government. That's what they believed. And of course, that was the whole point of ratifying the Constitution to create. Uh, all right, Mr. Tyler, good to see. You. Oh, I love first year A push teachers. All right, glad I can help. And so as far as that, Hamilton wants a strong central government, whereas the Jeffersonians, uh, the Jeffersonian Republicans or Democratic Republicans, you may see them called, are fans of states' rights. And so this is really the um, the biggest thing here, okay, that you now all of these go together, but the biggest thing here is a strong central government versus states' rights and a very limited federal government. Jefferson really kind of saw the Constitution as the articles on steroids. Uh, and so this is where you are getting into how much is the Constitution really that different from the articles? Now, the fears, okay, because a lot of things are driven by fear, especially in politics. And so Hamilton and Adams and the Federalists, they believe that the biggest fear that they have is, uh, oh, good, good. Okay, yes, yes, thank you, Art. And so anarchy and mob rule, whereas the Jeffersonians, they're scared of tyranny. And both of these are legitimate fears. You don't want to live in a state of anarchy and mob rule, but you also don't want to be in a situation where the government has become so powerful uh, that it starts to run on its own and doesn't give you any, uh, you know, any power to shape your own life. And the Constitution, now there's never a good time to use Comic Sans, but there are exceptions. And this is one of those. When we think about Hamilton and the Constitution, he's a loose constructionist. Like the Constitution is really, you know, it's just sort of, we can, we can bend it here and there, necessary and proper. Remember that elastic clause or necessary and proper clause, where it says that here are the powers of the government, but if there's another power you can think of that is, you know, Hamilton's like, as long as it's not immoral and as long as it's loosely related, then, then why not? Okay. So, but Jefferson is a, was a strict constructionist. So essentially that the powers that are enumerated, the ones that are listed, those are the ones that the government has. And when Jefferson looks at the necessary and proper clause, Jefferson is focusing on the word necessary. Now, when I'm in my classroom, I mention to my students, a lot of times there may be like somebody at the door and, and I ask one of my students to go get the door. Now, the thing is, I didn't tell the student to get up out of their seat and go get the door, but it's basically implied. Now, is it necessary? No, technically a student could scoot their desk over to the door and open it and then scoot their desk back. But it certainly makes it a lot easier if the student can just get up out of their seat and go do that. And typically if I tell a student, could you please get the door? I am implying that they can also uh, they can also get up out of their seat. And this is where Hamilton with loose construction is talking about implied powers. Uh, and uh, and what he's what he's got there is just, you know, a national bank that this government has some financial powers and the national bank will be helpful. Whereas Jefferson says it's not in there. I'm kind of going a little bit ahead there, but the bank is a really big deal. Now, Hamilton's support base is among the commercial elite. Now, when you look at the ratification of the Constitution, the first states to ratify the Constitution were states that were coastal, but Delaware, New Jersey, those states were very, very quick to ratify the Constitution. So that is his support base. Now, Jefferson, more rural and more aimed at the farmers. Now, this was a time when only about 5% of Americans lived in cities. And so that is, that is 
was a, a, a thing there that Hamilton's party has power very early, but they're going to lose it very quickly. So government involvement in the economy. Hamilton says, yes, that there should be economic development, that the government should try to do things to modernize the economy. Whereas Jefferson, the farmer, was a laissez-faire guy. Jefferson, the man of the Enlightenment, uh, believed that Smith's wealth of nations, that the the government should just stay out of the economy and create a create an environment where people can do their own thing. Taxes should be kept low. Regulation should be kept low. Hamilton's thinking it sure would be nice if we could manufacture stuff and the government should be taking a leading role in helping to bring that about. Now, the National Bank, okay, this is really, you want to make sure that you note this disagreement because it's really rooted in everything else, okay, because Hamilton, being a loose constructionist, wanting a strong central government, and also believing that the government has an important role to play in economic development, Hamilton says that the National Bank, it's, it's, not, it's not like the Constitution prohibits it, right? And that's his view. But Jefferson is very triggered by this. And Jefferson says, no, a national bank is not necessary for the government to execute the enumerated powers. Now, of course, Washington ends up going with Hamilton on this one uh, when Hamilton argues that the bank is constitutional. And of course, Hamilton is kind of in his wheelhouse because he was the secretary of the treasury. Now, a protective tariff. Now, this is another thing about the manufacturing. And remember that Jefferson was... Uh, you know, Jefferson believed, he wrote in the notes of this, on the state of Virginia, that he'd like to see no manufacturing in the United States. He thought it was filthy and dirty, and he thought we should farm and send our raw materials out, and we can take in these goods, and we don't have to have our people living in these filthy, dirty cities that Jefferson felt were, that they were going to bring down a Republican government. Jefferson felt like if we were going to be a Republican government, then we are going to have to be rural. We're going to have to be a nation of farmers. Now, Hamilton wanted a protective tariff in order to incur to discourage imports to help American manufacturers get on their feet. Jefferson was not a fan of this because this was going to inhibit trade. Federal assumption of state debts. Now, Hamilton had a really uh, interesting plan here as, as far as he said that all the states took on this war debt. And this is part of the problem with the articles that the states, okay, the, the states are fighting the war themselves. They're taking on the debts themselves. Congress didn't have really its own ability to borrow money. And so Hamilton said, what we need to do here is a lot of these debts are from the war and this was a national war. And Hamilton says, we should take the debts from the states and we should uh, make them all one. And so Jefferson, now, first of all, Virginia didn't really owe any money. So the Virginians weren't happy about this because they didn't really benefit from it. And then Jefferson saw what Hamilton was trying to do. Jefferson said, you're basically trying to put us all in a situation where we share a debt and it brings everybody closer. All right. And so as far as the central bank, now, another thing, uh, Diogo, about the, the bank, okay, Jefferson, uh, another thing about the Jeffersonians is a bank represents regulation of the economy, but also Jefferson felt like banks created artificial wealth. Uh, that he was distrustful of the financial sector. And he believed that the only wealth that was really like, you know, in any way truly valuable was uh, agriculture. There's, you know, this goes a little beyond a push, but you can get into what the, they call the physiocrats, which was a uh, kind of an economic school of thought that was into laissez-faire and it was into growing crops and all of that kind of stuff. But Jefferson, now that's another thing as far as the federal assumption of state debts. The way that Hamilton got Jefferson to at least acquiesce to this is he promised to back a proposal to get the capital out of New York City. Now, the government, Washington was first sworn in in New York City. And 
Jefferson, uh, you know, and Madison and others, they felt like they didn't want the capital right there in the financial side because New York has always been really kind of the financial capital of the United States. And so in order to get um, the state war debt, like in order to get the federal government to assume the state war debts, Hamilton promised to back the proposal to move the capital to its own district on the Potomac River. And Jefferson thought that sounds great because it gets the capital away from all these financial interests. Now, little did Jefferson know, and that's where like Cherno in his biography of Hamilton notes that Hamilton really was thinking a lot farther ahead here because all of the corrupt mechanisms can follow to this new capital. And you think about Washington, D.C. today, it would make Jefferson sick. Uh, but foreign policy. Now, that's the other side of this is when we look at the foreign policy. I've got a video on Washington's foreign policy. And Hamilton and the Federalist Anglophiles, meaning that they liked England, they liked the British. And meanwhile, Jefferson and Madison and their party were Francophiles. They liked the French. They had a preference for the French. And of course, when it gets to the French Revolution, that's going to be something that polarizes these parties and you know, put, put some distance between them in that sense. Okay, so that's really just a quick uh, kind of overview overview of what we've got there. And let me go back in here and uh, see some more questions. Okay, that was the main presentation portion. Now, of course, I've got a video about that as well, but sometimes people like to see that sort of thing, uh, sort of thing live. All right. Um, oh, my. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Some of y'all aren't familiar with me. Okay. Um, YouTube.com slash Tom Ritchie. All right. So I'm on YouTube. I've got a lot of, uh, I've got a lot of YouTube videos for a push. I've got even more for AP Euro, but uh, I teach a push as well. And so as far as that, yeah, I forget some of y'all are not, uh, not familiar with my work and that's fine. You know, that's a great, uh, that's a great thing about me working with Fiveable here. Okay. So let me go ahead and wow, that was a long answer there. Wasn't it Zoe? All right. Miss Dubinsky has got a question. She's got her crew here. All right. Washington calling for not okay. So as far as parties, I think that uh, Ms. Dubinsky's got a great uh, question here because I think that it's so timely. All right, if we think about this, uh, especially, and I may be getting ahead of myself. Uh, let me just make sure that they haven't uh, that I'm not talking about something that's not current. Okay, so it looks like uh, this is still going to be a thing, right? Uh, so as far as that goes, this whole Brett, uh, Brett Kavanaugh, all right? So you look at this Brett Kavanaugh thing, and there are all of these sides of the story and all of that. Now, what determines whether someone wants Brett Kavanaugh to be confirmed or not? Think about it. Okay, we had time to think about it. Partisanship. Somebody who's a Republican, uh, if you were to ask someone who's a Republican, should Brett Kavanaugh be confirmed? That person will say, oh, yeah, he's qualified and they're just this is a smear campaign against him. And then if you ask someone who's a Democrat, uh, the Democrat would, would more than likely say, I believe this woman and I believe that uh, Brett Kavanaugh uh, doesn't have the temperament to be on the court. And so now are there going to be some exceptions here and there? Sure. There are going to be some Democrats who may you know, say one way and some Republicans say the other. But when you look at this Brett Kavanaugh thing nobody's really concerned about the truth uh, or what happened. They're only concerned about getting a balance on the Supreme Court or really not a balance, but they want their side to predominate on the Supreme Court. And so people aren't really, and, and it's just really that we see in these confirmation hearings and this one, maybe we see that that it's going to be a little different from now on. I don't know. Maybe they'll take the cameras out of the hearings. I don't know, okay, but it seems to me that there's a, there's a problem somewhere that needs to be fixed. But the thing is that the way that this all plays out, that I think most people can agree that there's there's something there's some political power component here. Um, now, whether the the Democrats and the Republicans have their own roles that they're playing, but the Supreme Court, you look at something like the Supreme Court that's supposed to be impartial and all of that, and it's really more than anything about 
getting another Republican on there or not getting another Republican on there. You saw with, you know, when President Obama uh, nominated somebody, the Republicans who controlled the Senate said, we're not going to do this during an election year, okay, that this needs to be something that the next president deals with. And they didn't even give the nominee a hearing. And so when you look at this, I think this is what Washington's saying here is that when you have these permanent political parties, now I'm not talking about the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists who are, you know, they were fighting over one thing. So making a coalition for one issue, not a problem. But what happens is it stifles dialogue uh, that people don't really look for. Uh, yeah. And, and so the thing is that, yes, the Supreme Court is is just one of those things that it's one of many things that is it's become a partisan thing and people aren't trying to find like Washington. And of course, maybe this doesn't even exist anywhere, but I think Washington would envision a place where, you know, a government where the Senate is only looking at the qualifications of this judge. And it's not about whether the court will decide this and this. Now, the other thing is that you've got so much power in the Supreme Court that it becomes a uh, a thing, wherever you've got power, you're going to have fighting. But Washington really felt like that the partisan spirit was going to tear a republic apart because people, they see their own countrymen as enemies. So uh, I, I can tell you, I mean, I think most people, unless they're just totally like apolitical and they have their head in the sand, anybody who has political opinions, they, they can say that they've lost, you know, intentionally or unintentionally, they've lost friends over politics. And I don't think that Washington wanted to see that sort of thing because a republic is supposed to be about the common good, that everyone is working together for the common good. And when we have parties Parties are working for what they what they're trying to get as far as their power and the issues that they want and not about working together as a country. So I think that Washington, when you look at what's going on now, we can see exactly why Washington saw, you know, Washington saw this. They're they're saying that today that we're more polarized than at any time in modern American history and possibly at any time since the American Civil War, which is kind of scary when you think about it, because last time things were this heated between people, people started killing each other. And so as far as that, I think Washington, you know, he saw that really it's the partisan spirit. And, and that's another thing we get to the Civil War. Uh, you know, that's something that people, uh, they always want one word answers about what the Civil War was about. But really, the Civil War would not have happened if there had been a if there had been a consensus that we need to work together to solve the problems that our country is facing. And that was what part of what led to the Civil War, that people weren't serious about, hey, we have some problems here that we need to we need to work through together, but people only thought about their own immediate economic interests. And there you see that they start killing each other. So how much, let's see. So as far as that, uh, and Gabby, we've already gotten, gotten that with Ms. Dubinsky there. So we'll go ahead and consider that answered. So how much did the Jeffersonian Republicans change their original viewpoints? Now, Andre, that is something that when you take AP government, you're gonna learn about something called realignment. And so realignment is when, like the Democratic Party of today is not the Democratic Party of Andrew Jackson's time. Uh, it's not the Democratic Party of FDR's time. I would say that if you think about this, that today would Jimmy Carter be able to be a, to be nominated? Jimmy Carter, who's a you know, Southern pro-life Democrat, would Jimmy Carter be nominated by today's Democratic Party? Probably not. And so, you know, also you think about would Dwight Eisenhower be nominated by today's Republican Party? And so as far as as far as that, uh, the Jeffersonian Republicans, of course, they're going to change their viewpoints at some point because political parties are at the end of the day, they're about power. And so Jefferson, when he's looking at the Louisiana Purchase, now, of course, Jefferson's kind of like falling into his own trap here, uh, because when it comes down to it, Jefferson said, well, it doesn't say in the Constitution that the government can add land. 
And the thing is, though, his own people are telling him, but it says that you can make treaties. And when you make treaties, generally land changes hands. That's how treaties work. And so when you say the government can make treaties, then you're saying that the government can do things that that happens when you make treaties. And Jefferson's like, well, let's amend the Constitution. And his people tell him, we're not going to be able to amend the Constitution. New England's not going to go along with this. We're not going to be able to get three-fourths of the states to amend the Constitution, to have a special little thing that says, hey, you can have land. And Jefferson's finally like, okay, fine. I'll go along with it. Even though I don't like it, I'm going to go along with it. So when it comes down to it, and Jefferson felt like, remember I'd said that he believed that we must be agricultural in order to be Republican, in order not to turn into a European monarchy. And so with that, Jefferson felt like in adding all this farmland, he was ensuring the survival of the Republic. Now, another thing, Andre, is that when after the War of 1812, what happens is the Federalist Party ceases to exist. And so what happens really when you have this era of good feeling that the parties cease to exist, but the Jeff the, the Republican Party starts to absorb some Federalist ideas. So after the War of 1812, there's a ton of debt. Now, Madison in 1811 had let the first bank of the United States expire. It's like, we don't need it. I don't like banks. I'm a, I'm a Republican. After the War of 1812 a ton of debt. And with there being a ton of debt after the War of 1812, then uh, it's like we need a bank. And so then there was a bank. And then Henry Clay, who was kind of uh, you know, eating crow or maybe eating hawk would be better because Henry Clay had been a war hawk. And Henry Clay had been saying, we, want it, we need to go to war with the British. And then we go to war with the British and the British like whip us and whip us and whip us. And then finally we whip them at the end. Woo, America. But the British uh, showed us that we weren't really ready to fight wars. And so Henry Clay is thinking in terms of we need, and that's what a lot of Jeffersonians, of course, you've got the quids who were, they, they stood by the original Jeffersonian platform, but the Republicans start opening up to, okay, we need to have manufacturing. So the tariff of 1816, a protective tariff was signed into law by Madison. So the thing is, after the War of 1812, you have Madison chartering the Second Bank of the United States when he had argued against the First Bank. And then you've got Madison signing a protective tariff when he had argued against that previously. So parties always change their original view viewpoints as the situation changes. 20 years from now, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party will be a bit, uh, bit different than they are now. But I would say that the Democratic Party and the Republican Party will likely still exist. They will just have put together a different coalition of voters. All right, can I go over the Washington administration? Esmeralda, the Jefferson versus Hamilton stuff I did earlier goes into that. Also, if you go take a look at my video on Washington's foreign policy, that's something that is important as well And getting that foreign policy like the Jay Treaty, the Citizen Guinea Affair, and all of that kind of stuff. And then I'm about to answer Javier's question. So that'll, that'll answer your question as well. So Javier, how was Hamilton the founder of the nation's financial system? All right, so Hamilton, Hamilton uh, put together a few reports. He put together, but the one that really, when we think about the financial system, uh, the report on public credit. And what Hamilton's trying to do, you see all those things like where, like freecreditreport.com, that sort of thing. Now, I actually, before I was teaching, uh, my first job out of college was selling cars. I lasted for about six weeks and got uh, just sick of it. And so I was selling cars. And when somebody's interested in a car, you you take, you take them for a test drive and then you bring them back and you're like, well, are you interested? And they say, yeah, I think I'm interested. And so, okay, well, let's go to the next phase. Well, next thing I need, I need to do is I need to pull up their credit report. Now, sometimes I would pull up a credit report and it'd be like, okay, it was, well, it was like, 650, 700, 750. And it's like, okay, they can have any car they want. But then there'd be people that they had a great test drive. They're like, oh, I want to get this car. And their credit report, their credit score is like 
480 or something like that, or, you know, 500 or something, you're just like, okay, this is probably going to be a little bit of a problem, just depending. And so the better credit somebody has, the more they can borrow. And so Hamilton is, in his report on the public credit, he is trying to create, like the United States had a terrible credit score, and he wanted to create a situation, that's why he proposed the Bank of the United States, that that would help to build public credit. That's why he proposed the federal assumption of state debts, because in order to build credit, now this is something y'all want to remember when y'all go to college, get a credit card as soon as you can. Now, don't use it for a lot of stuff, like go, like, go to a restaurant and pay for a meal with it or actually not that like get your groceries with it like the stuff you'd buy anyway or get gas maybe you're like okay i'm going to use this credit card to buy gas every month something i'd always buy and every month pay it off all right so pay it off every month and you are building credit so you borrow a little money you pay it back you borrow a little money you pay it back and so when people pull up your credit report they want to see like how much money have you borrowed and how much have you paid back? And so right now the United States is like 20 something trillion dollars in debt, right? But we've shown that we can pay it back. Now, of course, you know, we'll, we'll see where things go from here. At a certain point, we're probably going to be in some trouble if things keep going this way. But Hamilton with the report on the public credit is in the creation of the Bank of the United States. That's why he has this reputation as the founder of the nation's financial system. All right. So, uh, can you just give an overview about Jefferson versus Hamilton? Already did, uh, Lupe. Let's see. So look at the, when you see the rebroad, like if you look back at the broadcast, also youtube.com slash Tom Ritchie, you'll see me over there. All right. So as far as that, let me see what we've, a uh, few more things uh, here. Uh, was the formation of the two-party system inevitable? It, given our type of government, kind of okay now what we see um shana is that and this is something you'll go into in ap government as well that single member districts now it, like if you look at the netherlands or israel or other countries that have multi-party systems uh, what they have in common is people go to the polls and they vote for a party and depending how much support a party gets that's how many seats they get in the legislature or the parliament and or the Knesset in the case of, uh, of Israel. And so as far as that goes, people go vote for a party and there may be 10 or 10 or more parties and those parties have to build coalitions in order to form a government. But in countries with single member districts, like Jeff Duncan is my congressman. Uh, yeah, I live in South Carolina's third district. That there tend to be, it, there's a tendency for a two party system to form. So I would say that there was, given the way that our government's designed and having the single member districts, there is a bit of an inevitability in that happening. And for some reason, that, as much as people complain about the two party system, it's going to be with us until we change our type of government. All right. And then we've got a few questions about the Louisiana purchase, or at least one here. So Susan, can you explain the importance of New Orleans part of the Louisiana purchase? So remember that Jefferson really just wanted to buy New Orleans. At first he said, go to the French and see what we can do to buy New Orleans. Now, the problem is that, see, this is a time before uh, and, and this is what's going to happen like in the antebellum period, you're going to see like turnpikes, canals, steamships, of course, railroads in the 1850s. But this was a time before railroads. This was a time when it was very difficult to transport freight by ground. And so anybody that was in like not only Louisiana, but Mississippi, Tennessee, Ohio, Illinois, uh, Indiana, in Kentucky, any of these places are using the port of New Orleans in order to 
uh, you know, in order to get their crops to market because people who are growing crops and they've got excess that they're putting to market. So they were dependent on New Orleans and bringing their stuff down the Mississippi. Now, when Spain controlled New Orleans, there was one point where Spain threatened to, I, I forget if they threatened to or whether they actually did revoke what was called the right of deposit. So that if there are some crops coming down from Illinois or from Tennessee or Kentucky, then we can leave those at New Orleans and they can wait until it's time for, you know, for them to be taken uh, to their next destination, like to Europe or somewhere else. And so what happens here is that we're dependent. And also what happens if this power just decides, you know, what, whether it's Spain or France, that they're going to block the Mississippi. They're going to say, you know what, you don't have free navigation in the Mississippi anymore. And so this is something that is a, a really big deal because uh, that way, if the Mississippi's closed off to us, if New Orleans is closed off and we don't have access, then we're going to see a situation where these Western farmers can't get their crops to market. And that is not a good thing. So New Orleans was a very, very important port city. All right. And going with uh, with that, uh, you know, let's see. So. All right. Uh, yes, Alan, I would say that you are fine as long as you understand regions for the most part. Now, my home state of South Carolina, there are some times where you have to know, like, for example, those of you that are studying Jackson, uh, when you get to Andrew Jackson, you get to the nullification crisis. It's really not going to be sufficient to say, oh, one of those southern states uh you know or others so one of those southern states tried to nullify the tariff you should know that that was south carolina so there are some like massachusetts in reference to the american revolution that would be important south carolina in reference to the nullification crisis or in reference to secession before the civil war that's important so if there's something that involves that directly involves an individual state then you should know that but knowing every Every state, uh, I don't think that that's necessarily a big uh, a big deal. Like I could think of certain there there are states that you could probably do fine not really knowing. Like I'm not sure if there's a point where I can think of where Delaware, for example, like why it would be important for you to know something specific about the state of Delaware. Now I'll watch that be the DBQ or something like that this year. But it really depends on the importance. But if you think about a state like Massachusetts in the American Revolution or South Carolina and the nullification crisis, yes. But other than that, knowing regions and knowing general trends is much more important. To what extent did the War of 1812 constitute a second American revolution? I think that there's a certain amount of just uh, cuteness about that, that it just sounds good. But at the same time, it is another war with Britain and it's another war with Britain fought within a lifetime of the American Revolution. And there, so a few things here. First of all, I think Britain kind of thought that this whole United States thing was eventually going to fail. Uh, another thing is that the United States needed to get over this obsession with Canada and this obsession with Canada coming in. So there are some things here where the British have been beaten another another time. But then again, were they really beaten? I, who knows? But as far as that goes, the United States showed that we could actually make a war and we could actually hold our own, even though it wasn't going so well. And then there's that spirit of nationalism that came from the War of 1812 that I think the American Revolution also produced a certain amount of nationalism, if you think about it, even though not to the same extent. But I think that it was something that we're growing together as a nation. But as far as a second American Revolution, I think it's just one of those to me it's just one of those kind of clever titles uh that people put on something that when you start to really think about it was uh, that sort of thing that's my take on it at least all right so james monroe and the era of good feelings all right so james monroe now this is something that i really like monroe and i think he needs to get more attention okay because as as far as that goes that 
James Monroe was elected in 1816 by a pretty strong margin, but he didn't get a lot of support in New England. Now, then what does James Monroe do? His first months in office, like the first trip he takes when he's in office, is he goes on a goodwill tour of New England. He decides that I want to go and I want to talk to the people who didn't vote for me. And this was a this was an era where you know politicians were expected to not be like basically James Monroe was a member of the Republican Party, but the president was not seen as a party leader, okay? So the president, once they took office, is supposed to be someone who is the president of everybody. And so when Monroe goes up to New England, one of the newspapers says that we're seeing an era of good feeling. People couldn't believe it. It's like this president from Virginia come is coming up here and he's coming to see us. And that is something that they that that they really appreciate. And that brings about the air of good feelings. Now, not that there's not political conflict. The uh, the Missouri, the Missouri crisis. This is during the era of good feelings. But it's the time when it, you see that James Monroe, when he's reelected, he gets all but one electoral vote. So there was still one holdout from New England that decided they were going to vote for John Quincy Adams, who was then the next president. Uh, but that's the other thing, too that while Jefferson picked Madison, a fellow Virginian, as his secretary of state, and Madison picked Monroe, a fellow Virginian, as his secretary of state, James Monroe picked John Quincy Adams, a New Englander. So that's the whole idea that like, you know what, as my secretary of state, I'm bringing in a New Englander. I don't want it to be a Virginia. He's the last member of the Virginia dynasty, but he's showing that we can have a national you know, like a national government uh, that we, I mean, nationals may be a tough word here to use for that, but we can have a government that represents, uh, you know, the entire country and not just a government that represents a single political faction. And also asking John Quincy Adams, not just any New Englander, but the son of the last Federalist president, that was a big deal. Now, the Monroe Doctrine, this was a statement of foreign policy at this time. Now, remember, after the War of 1812, I always like to bring in Henry Clay's American system, okay? So, National Bank, Internal Improvements, and Protective Tariff. And what Henry Clay's American system was trying to do was to create a system, to create a, a system where we're no longer dependent on Europe. And so, you know, the Jeffersonian economic model was like we make raw materials and agricultural products and we trade with Europe for finished goods. Now, Henry Clay's American system is about we need to make our own stuff and we need to be less dependent on Europe. Now, the Monroe Doctrine says that, well, these you have all these Latin American revolutions. And what we don't want to see is European countries sending armies here to the Americas to try to uh, subdue the, you know, the, we don't want Europe reclaiming these areas. So the Monroe Doctrine, I always relate this to George H.W. Bush, who in 1988 said, read my lips, no new taxes. Now, George H.W. Bush didn't keep his promise, but James Monroe is like, read my lips, no new colonies, that he said that the United States would not support any efforts by Europe to recolonize, to, to make any new colonies in the Americas. Now, another thing to note is that the United States did not have the ability to back that up at the time, okay? That the United States did not have the ability to back it up, but the British agreed with it. The British didn't want to see like, you know, Spain's, it was a lot of Spain's colonies that were asserting their independence. And so the British were like, you know what, we like this. All right. So as far as as far as that now, the three parts of the Monroe Doctrine. Oh, not the Monroe Doctrine. OK, so as far as as far as that, uh, I wasn't saying the three parts of the Monroe Doctrine, the Monroe Doctrine. I was <coughs> I was relating it to Henry Clay's American system. NIP. OK, NIP, National Bank, Internal Improvements. and a protective tariff.
Okay. So national bank internal improvements and protective tariff. That was Henry Clay's American system. Now the Monroe Doctrine, as I was saying, is something that kind of plays into that because this is a time where the United States is consciously trying to distance itself from Europe. Okay, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, now uh, some of y'all are still on the American Revolution. And are, I mean, well, yeah, we got some there and then Articles of Constitution. Some of y'all are already into the Jefferson administration. Now, next week, we will probably take a look. Now, we can certainly take a look at uh, the Adams administration and the Alien and Sedition Acts. We haven't done that yet, but we can go into Jefferson. We'll see where things look, okay? So I see that a lot of people are in different places. And again, we'll see where things go. And, you know, if we need to slow down a little bit, we can. It's always, these sessions are always going to revolve around you and what it is that you want. That's the whole point of Fiveable is to be here and to meet you wherever you are, even though, you know, you saw that I typically will have some kind of presentation that's, you know, got something that's going to be very important on the exam. All right. Well, thank y'all for coming. Be sure to tell your friends about Fiveable. And also, I'm not not sure exactly when or how long these weekly broadcasts are going to continue to be free to the public. Now, some of y'all, your teachers got Fiveable for teachers and you're in. Like, you know if your teacher's on Fiveable. Also, you know if you've subscribed to Fiveable. But right now, I think it's only like $15 to get Fiveable for the rest of the year. So if you are not a current subscriber to Fiveable, you want to consider that because there's going to be a certain point where they're going Going to some of these sessions are going to be reserved for people who have either uh, subscribed to Fiveable themselves or their teachers have. So remember that if you if you're just kind of dropping in on these things, make and you like them, you think they're helping, make sure that you go over to Fiveable.me and pick up pick up a subscription. Okay, so make sure. But but I'll have some more information on that sometime, and of course you'll get emails from Fiveable about that. All right. Well, I will see y'all next Wednesday at 7 p.m. It is always a pleasure. Oh, you're very, you're very welcome, Zoe. Very welcome. Thanks for coming.